verse 1, 2 Kings 5, verse 1. Now Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel, a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God, my Lord, were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. And one went in and told his Lord, saying, Thus and thus said the maid that is of the land of Israel. <coughs> Excuse me. And the king of Syria said, Go to, go, and I will send a letter unto the king of Israel. And he departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand pieces of gold and ten changes of raiment. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, Now when this letter is come unto thee, behold, I have therewith sent Naaman my servant to thee, that thou mayest recover him of his leprosy. And it came to pass, when the king of Israel had read the letter, that he rent his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive that this man doth send unto me to recover a man of his leprosy? Wherefore, consider, I pray you, and see how he seeketh a quarrel against me. And it was so, when Elisha, the man of God, had heard that the king of Israel had rent his clothes, that he sent to the king, saying, Wherefore hast thou rent thy clothes? Let him come now to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Verse 9, So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot, and stood at the door, of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for each one here today. We pray that there's a lost soul here in the building. We pray you might save them before they leave. We pray for your people, God, that you help us to live for you in these last days that we live in, dear God. Help us to draw nigh to you. You said you draw nigh to us. Father, have your perfect will in each and every heart and life. God, we thank you and praise you for everything you've done for us and through us and in us, dear God. We thank you. And we praise you in Jesus' precious name. And amen. 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 We read here in 2 Kings 5, verses 1 to 11. This is concerning Naaman, who is a captain of the host of the king of Syria. And uh, he's told by Elisha, <coughs> the man of God, or in verse 10 says, Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be cleaned. But Naaman was wroth and went away. He's angry. He's mad. And said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. The reason why Naaman is angry is because he had preconceived ideas of how he was going to be cleansed of his leprosy. I've been preaching a series of messages on verses in the Bible that contain the word nothing. Nothing. And I left off last time on the nothings from expectation. The, the nothings from expectation. Uh, he says, behold, I thought here in 2 Kings 5.11. These are words of expectations. And uh, General Naaman was a man who became angry because others did not meet his expectations. Has everybody always met your expectations? Andre... Francois Raffre, a retired lawyer in Aries, France, made what any reasonable businessman would say was a sound financial decision. According to the Chicago Tribune, for a $500 a month annuity payment to her, <coughs> excuse me, he bought the rights to take over an apartment in Aries, France, on the death of its current resident. The woman living in the apartment was Jean Calment. She was 90 years old. 30 years later, and $180,000 poorer, Raffray had still not moved into the apartment. On February 21, 1995, Jean Calment celebrated her 120th birthday. 
She was the oldest person in the world at that time. Each year on her birthday, she sent Raffray a card that jokingly said, Sorry, but I'm still alive. <laughs> Mr. Raffray thought he had made a good investment, but his expectation in the life expectancy of Jean Calment turned out to be disappointing. She ended up celebrating two more birthdays before she died. In fact, Jean outlived Mr. Raffray, who died at the age of 77 on Christmas Day, 1995. His expectation in taking over the apartment left him with nothing. The nothings from expectation. Life is full of disappointment and unfulfilled expectations. Have you ever made, had a promise made to you and it was broken? Have you ever depended upon somebody or someone to fulfill the expectation that you had in your head, but the person or the thing that you had in your head did not come through for you? Perhaps your expectation was a job you needed done and it wasn't completed or it wasn't done correctly. Some of you business guys in here, you probably have employees where you thought you were going to give somebody a job and uh, it didn't uh, pan out uh, the way you thought. Maybe you were keep, uh, hoping to get a certain gift at Christmas or your birthday, but you didn't get it. It could be that you had your heart set on a position, on a team, or a promotion at work or a raise, but it didn't pan out. It left you hurt, left you sad. Uh, Naaman had false expectations. Expectations can leave us with nothing sometimes when they're unfulfilled or leave us feeling empty when we get what we wanted. Sometimes people are empty when they get what they thought they wanted. Disappointment hounds us when our plans are pulverized and our friends are fickle and our dreams are destroyed and our expectations are eradicated. It's no fun when your goals or expectations fizzle and fail and flop and they're foiled. We all have faced those moments of unfulfilled expectations that also leave our hearts a little sick. How we respond to those disappointments will have a lot to do with how we cope with life, whether we will be merry or miserable, happy or snappy, calm or cantankerous, delighted or depressed. Realize also that life is not all about our expectations. It's about Him. Amen. Amen? Life is not about your way, your popularity, your power, or your things. It's about Him. Folks, Jesus Christ is the one that really matters. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. David had to learn this in his own life. He suffered one disappointment after another. He was harassed, hurt by people that he loved and thought loved him, yet God had a purpose in his perilous predicaments. Many of the Psalms are written out of David's brokenness. You'll find that people don't always meet your expectations. When we expect people to come through at a certain time, to do a certain thing, to respond a certain way, or act in an expected manner, and they don't, it can be frustrating and very, very disappointing. Delilah expected Samson to tell her the secret of his strength. <clears throat> when he didn't, she was very disappointed with him because he did not do what she expected him to do in Judges 16, verses 10 to 16. Expectations are one of the elements of everyday life. When you think about it, we are expected people. We expect things in life. We are people of hope. We have dreams and desires that we hope will come to pass. How we handle our expectations will determine how we handle life itself and how life handles us. If we put all our expectations in people, we make them a prisoner of our expectations. Psalm 62, 5, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. From Him. If they don't come through for us when we expect them, then we become bitter, disappointed, or depressed. And they become angry with us because of the way, we were, we're, uh, the way that we're responding to them. For some people, no matter what folks do for them, they're never happy because of the expectations they place upon people who can never reach or attain what is expected of them. I want to say this. If you are expecting true fulfillment in your life through any human being, you're going to be disappointed. 
right. Yeah. Amen. Now, when I say this, some of you might not agree, but you cannot expect it through your spouse. You cannot expect it through your children, your grandchildren, your dog, your cat, your parakeet, or your job, or your money, or your investments, or your retirement, or your pension, or your social security, or anybody, or anything in your life. It has to come through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ Amen. and a walk with him. Amen. Walk in communion with God. General Naaman was a man who became angry because others did not meet his expectations. You notice here in 2 Kings 5.11, but Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought. Here's what he thought. He will surely come out to me and stand and call the name of the Lord his God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Several things about this, about his expectations. Number one, Naaman expected to be honored, but instead he was humbled. He expected to be honored. He was used to being the big G's. He's a captain. He said, behold, I thought he would surely come out to me. He'll come out to me because I'm somebody. The words to me are emphatic. There was no red carpet treatment. No one honored him or fussed over him as they did in Syria. In Syria, they made a big deal about it. <clears throat> he expected to be honored, but instead he was humble. Number two, he expected the sensational, but got the simple. He said, what do you mean, preacher? He thought Elisha would call on God, wave his hand, and heal him. That's how Naaman pictured being healed in his mind. It was to be something spectacular, but Naaman didn't get the spectacular at all. And sometimes in our lives, we expect the spectacular, and it doesn't come to fruition. Right. I mean, it doesn't happen like you thought it was going to happen. I mean, I've got a message I preached here a few years ago, false expectations from this same text about Naaman. And uh, I, I, false ex people have false expectations about life. They have false expectations about marriage. They have false expectations for their children. They think their children are going to be this great, super-duper, wonderful person, and they end up maybe not being a super-duper, wonderful person. They might not end up being a great spiritual giant for God. They might not end up being really a whole lot, for not only for God, for anything. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of disappointed parents. Uh, people have uh, false expectations about their job, about their business. About, I mean, you just go on and on. You get list 50 things. And people have false expectations about it. And how you meet those things and how head on is going to determine whether you have the victory in your life, you have that joy and that peace of God, and your testimony continues on for God. You see? And uh, Naaman wanted the plan changed, but it was not open for debate. It was to be very simple. Go wash in the Jordan River seven times is what he was told here in the verses we read. He's like, what? I thought, is that it? I thought it was going to be more spectacular than that. You know, people make the same mistake today. They think there's better ways to be saved than through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And it takes, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And, and unfortunately, we got a lot of folks around this area that think you get the blood of Christ by getting baptized. Yeah. You don't get the blood by getting baptized. You don't get the blood by joining a church. Yeah. You don't get the blood by having good works and being a nice, sweet, dear person. Yeah. You get the blood of Christ washing away your sins by repenting of your sins and receiving Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior by faith into your heart as a free gift. Amen. You're trusting in nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I got saved June 16, 1977. And since then, you ask me if I'm saved, I say yes. If you ask me if I'm saved, I don't say, yeah, I got baptized. Or, yeah, I joined a church. Or, yeah, I try to be good. I don't say none of that. Now, I did all that after I got saved. I followed the Lord in believer's baptism by immersion, joined a Bible-believing church, rolled up my sleeves, got busy for God the last Amen. almost 45 years. So thank God for that. But I'm not trusting in any works, anything I've done in the past, what I'm doing right now, or anything in the future. I'm trusting in nothing but Jesus Christ to get Amen. me to heaven. Amen. That's the only reason why Steve Kogel's going to heaven. It has nothing to do with me. 
I witnessed to a person one time, they said, well, that's a great, wonderful thing that you decide to change your life like that. I said, well, I didn't change it. Jesus changed it. Amen. Yeah. I know what they meant by it. They, they, they're nice people. They just... The people think there's better ways than to be saved. The cross of Calvary is offensive and foolish to this world. Mm -hmm. You know what they think? They think like Naaman. But there's got to be more to it. You mean you believed in, from your heart, you repented and received Christ as your Savior, and you're saying that's a, a dead, a Jew that died 2,000 years ago on the cross was buried and rose again, and you believe that by faith, and that's what's going to get you to heaven? They think it's too simple. Paul talked about the simplicity that is in Christ in 2 yeah. Corinthians 11.3. It's simple to be saved. When it gets hard, it's following the Lord after you get saved. That's right. Discipleship. That, that word disciple, you see that word discipline in that word? Discipline, disciple. It takes some discipline to follow Jesus. You know, it says in John 6, from that time, many of his disciples, disciples, they follow the Lord for a time, period of time. You got people all over this country like that, all over the world. They got saved, they got born again, they followed the Lord for a few days, weeks, months, or years, and something happened in their life. And you can't find them with the FBI, the CIA, a magnifying glass, a SWAT team, the KGB, or the ATF. Right. Something happened. There's a, there was a controversy with God. It could be one of a thousand different areas. But they, that God asked something of them or required something of them or wanted something of them, and they said, no way, Jose, I'm out of here. And John 6, 66, 666, John 6, 66 says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Right, yeah. And Jesus turned to the 12 and said, will you also go away? I got a message I preach, will you also go away? Why do people go away from the Lord? Well, there's about a hundred different reasons. Will ye also go away? And Peter, who put his foot in his mouth a lot, but he didn't this time, he got this one right. He said, Lord, to whom shall we go? Yeah. He said, Thou hast the words of eternal life. Amen. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You got it right on that statement, didn't you? Yeah. You know what? You know what? You know what the disciples said there in John six. They told Jesus. Jesus just got done saying a bunch of things. It's a long chapter, John six. I think there's seventy one verses in that chapter. But Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, going back and forth and preaching different things. And the disciples say that tells the Lord that that you offended some people. What you've said offended them. People get offended by preaching. That's right. You preach the Bible today. They they want you to get up and get some little Joel Osteen, little Joyce Meyer, little sermonette type of thing, and, and how great and wonderful you are, and something good is going to happen to you, and all that stupid junk. And that's why this country is going to hell in high gear. Because yeah. preachers are not preaching the Word of God. Yeah. They're interested in nickels and noses. Yeah. A lot of people and a lot of money. Nickels and noses. Naaman wanted to be cleansed on his own terms, not God's. Naaman's expectation led not only to his anger, but to a response of pride. He was concerned about his dignity and pride. He was a high official. He had a big position. He was somebody, he thought. God was going to humble him, though. You know, God has ways to humble you. Yeah. Understand that this man was highly esteemed in his country. He was, used to the, he was used to the applause and praise of people. They loved him in Syria. Now this prophet, told, this prophet told him through his servant, go wash in the Jordan River seven times. The Jordan River? What about the other rivers? That's what he says in the next verse, doesn't he? Does he say in verse 12, uh, are not Abana and far part rivers of Damascus? See, Syria, he wants to go back to those rivers. Better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. I'm taking my marbles and going home. <laughs> Big baby. Amen. <clears throat> we got a lot of thin-skinned people in this country. Amen. A lot of thin-skinned Christians, man. You go up to them like this and go like this. Woo! <laughs> 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 I'll tell you what, to serve God, you gotta have 
Brother Jack Wood told me years ago, he said, preacher, he said, if you're going to preach the Word of God, and you're going to preach and preach and preach the Word of God, he said, pastor of church, he said, you got to have a hide like a rhinoceros. Amen. <laughs> Didn't understand what he meant years ago. Since then I have. <laughs> Notice how I smiled when I said that. <laughs> Pride places an excessive premium price on self. It demands more than you are worth. Pride is the difference between what you are and what you think you are. That's right. That's right. Naaman's expectations were not met because the Lord was trying to show Naaman how little he was and how big God is. Amen. Yeah. Like naming expectations can get you into trouble when those expectations are wrong or unrealistic. Are expectations wrong? No. God expects us to live and behave a certain way. He expects us to obey His commands, do His will, do what's right. Our, our parents, parents expect their children to obey them. A husband or wife expects their spouse to love them and be faithful. These are, these are realistic expectations. God also expects us to hope or trust in Him. If you're expecting everyone to cater to your every whim and need in order to make you happy, then both you and others who are enslaved by your attitude will be miserable. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. You've got to keep your eyes on the Lord. Yeah. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yeah. Hebrews 12, 2. We are encouraged to depend upon God for our happiness, satisfaction, and needs. Our expectation or hopes are to be in Him. Your expectations in others can leave you dissatisfied and unfulfilled, while your expectations in God can leave you content and happy. That's what we're going over on Sunday nights. We'll go over that tonight. In Ecclesiastes, Solomon Writes, he writes as a man under the sun. The expression under the sun is used several times. He's writing, when he wrote Proverbs, he was right with God. And then later in his life, he committed idolatry. And after he went through all this junk and all this chastening, all this stuff in his life, he writes uh, Ecclesiastes, and he t tells you there, I hated life. I had pools. I had made men servants, maid servants. I had, I had women. He had 700 wives, 300 concubines. He, had, he said, I made me this, I made me that. He had property, he had land, he had houses, he had wealth, he had wine, he had women, he had everything. And Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 18, he said, I hated life. How could a man be that rich and have everything he had and hate life? When you leave God out of your life, that's the way you are. Amen. And I, I'll say it again, I've said it many times. You're a body, you're a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. You're like a football or a basketball, as I've said many times. Pretend this is a football or basketball. Outside's the leather. When you look at me, you see my leather, my flesh. I'm in this body, but I'm a soul. When I die and depart this life, I'm going straight to heaven. Amen. All right? But I just leave this body. I'm just, I carry around this body. This body is what gives me my problems, the flesh. This whole outside of the football, basketball is the leather. That's the flesh. And right inside is the bladder. It's usually like dark blue or black. It's the same shape as the body, the soul. The soul has a bodily shape. We went over that in our verse-by-verse -verse study in Revelation. The souls of them that were beheaded, all that stuff in Revelation. The soul has a bodily shape. And then uh, it's, it's the same shape as the body. And then the air inside is the spirit. <coughs> And you're born of your mother's womb. You're a live body, a live soul, and a dead spirit. That's why you've got to be regenerated, saved, born again. All those words are used interchangeably to mean the same thing. And so uh, you're a live body. You're like a tricycle, three wheels. Live body, live soul, and dead spirit. And God has so constituted a human being, a human soul, when they're born of their mother's womb, <laughs> that there is nothing and no way that you will ever be happy and contented and have joy and peace and victory in your life, truly, truly, until you A, get saved, and B, walk with God. Amen. Everything else is vanity, and that's what Ecclesiastes talks about, and that's what Solomon talks about, and that's amazing. You say, well, that's just him. Maybe he wasn't happy, but if I had all the things he had, I'd be a happy. No, you wouldn't. 
God put that book and other verses, of course, all through the Bible, but he put Ecclesiastes in there to show us that that's why Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Yeah. People are trying to have abundance of possessions and material yeah. things, and they're so miserable. Look at their faces. I just flew out to California. On the way out, I stopped and uh, lay over in Phoenix. Phoenix, you might as well go to L.A., but I don't know. So. And, uh, and on the way back, I went through Denver. Both, all airports are totally packed. People coming from everywhere. And I had layovers, and I watched people. And I've never seen so many miserable people in my life. I'm not saying you got to laugh and giggle 24 hours a day. But I'm going to tell you what, you can tell people don't have the joy of the Lord in their life. I know we go through trials. I know we go through heartaches. I'm not saying that we don't. I know there's disappointing, depressing times. But I'm going to tell you what, I still have joy unspeakable and full of glory in my heart and life. Amen. Amen. As one, one new Christian said, he said, I feel better now in the bad times than I used to feel in the good times before I got saved, so-called good times. And I'll tell you, Jesus said, come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my, my yoke, his yoke, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah, yeah. His burden's light. Matthew said, I'm just under a heavy burden. Well, get rid of it. Get Jesus' burden. He said, his burden is light. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Well, you have to learn mentally, just as you physically you don't do certain things, your deeds, your actions, you have to learn to think right also, not just do right. You've got to learn to think right. When those thoughts come in, of discouragement and depression and down in the dumps and that type of thing. And the devil says, what happens about this? What if happens if this happens? And what about this? And what about that? And, and gets you all upset about things that haven't even happened yet. You ever notice a lot of those things never happen? Yeah. A lot of those things that you worry about don't even come to pass or it's not near as bad as you thought it was going to be or the devil had you convinced that it was going to be. Yeah, Because he's a liar. Yeah. Right. Jesus right. said the devil's a liar. John 8, 44. He said to the Pharisee, you are of your father the devil... And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. Yes. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For this, Jesus said this about the devil. For he is a liar and the father of it. Right. He said that to the Pharisees. No wonder why they murdered him. <clears throat> this verse is rich with truth about expectations. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, the word come means come here or come on. Jesus said, come here to me. This is a command that Jesus expects us to keep. And there's a number of things that the Lord does expect from us. The words labor and heavy laden describe a person that's weary, exhausted, and loaded down with burdens. Such traits are possessed by those who have suffered unfulfilled expectations. They're weary, they're exhausted, and they're burdened. You ever felt that way? I don't know. Probably none of you have. Many have experienced these circumstances and feelings. God offers to us his rest. I'm glad for his rest. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Rest means to cease from labor in order to recover and collect your strength, to refresh, to enjoy calm, peace, and rest with patient expectation and hope. God has a reason for our disappointments. God allows our expectations to go unfulfilled sometimes so that we will learn to put our expectations in Him. There's a purpose in our disappointments or unfulfilled expectations. It is our expectation in the Lord that gives us hope and rest in His care. God is our strong tower of refuge. Thank God for that. This is why we need to learn to put our expectations in Him. When we put our expectations in Him, He does not leave us with nothing. He provides for all our needs in His own way, in His own time. He always does more than what we expect. Amen. Ephesians 3.20 says, The Lord's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. Numerous examples are given throughout Scripture of His abounding provisions. 
Uh, Joseph was not only delivered from prison, but put in a position of authority where he could save his own family, which we're going to see in Genesis. Job was not only delivered for his afflictions, but given double of what he had before. I mean, Job went through it. But thank God there's the rest of the story. God blessed him with twice as much as he had before. The three Hebrew children in Babylon were not only delivered from the flames of fiery furnace by the Lord himself, but were put into leadership in Babylon. Their testimonies made an impact upon the king. Daniel was not only delivered from the lion's den, but his enemies were destroyed and was, he was promoted in the position of authority. See, when you pass the test and you go through a trial, God will exalt you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. 1 Peter 5, verse 6. James 4, 10. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. He shall lift you up. See, all these people that we just spoke about, they all went through some fiery furnaces, fiery trials of life, and when they got through them and they passed the test, God exalted them a little bit. And God will exalt you in front of other people. It's not to get you a big head, because then he's got to humble you. That's not a very nice process. So he don't want you to get a big head, but he'll bless you and he'll promote you. And he'll exalt you. Esther and Mordecai saw the Lord destroy wicked Haman as he hung upon the gallows. He, he had prepared for Mordecai. He also saw the Lord work out a way for the Jews to protect themselves from a royal law of execution and illegally destroy their enemies within the Persian Empire. Uh, childless Hannah. Hannah didn't have any children. She promised God she would give her child to the Lord if he would only bless her with a baby. Samuel was born and she kept her word. God did not stop there. He gave her five more children, of which three were boys and two were girls. Five is the number of grace and death in the Bible. And God was demonstrating his grace to Hannah and giving to her exceedingly abundantly above all that she might have thought. Amen. Amen. God is our refuge. Our expectations are to be in him and he will never fail us. Amen. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it, they run into it, and is safe. Uh, expectations. Expectations. Paul said in Philippians 1.20, he said, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now so Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Keeping your focus on the Lord, especially through times of suffering and trial, will leave you at peace and joy in times of, and circumstances that are contrary to what you want. Paul fixed his eyes on Christ and was determined that in nothing he would be ashamed. He'd be a witness for Christ. Paul knew he would someday appear before the Lord and he did not want to be ashamed at all. Amen? Didn't want to be ashamed. 2 Corinthians 5, 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Now, we're not going to stand at the judgment seat for our sins. Those were already settled at Calvary. When you got saved, when you got born again, your past, present, and future sins were taken care of as far as your salvation is concerned. You have to confess your sins daily to stay in fellowship with the Lord. That's what 1 John 1, 9 is talking about. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when you study 1 Corinthians 3, we went over this in our verse-by-verse -verse study in 1 Corinthians a few years ago. But that judgment seat of Christ in verses 10 to 15, 1 Corinthians 3, talks about the judgment seat of Christ, wood, hay, and stubble, all that type of thing. And uh, he says there that every man's work, says it twice in those verses, not every man sins. This is to save people. So the judgment seat is not you for your sins. It's for everything done in your body. You say, well, what about the sins? The sin, I don't understand that whole thing there, but it says every man's work shall be tried. Every man's work. Doesn't say, doesn't say sins nowhere in the verses. So the judgment seat of Christ, your sins were taken care of when you got saved and you got born again. You have eternal redemption. The, the, the dear folks that believe you can lose your salvation, they don't understand that. They don't understand that it's eternal redemption Amen. when you got saved. 
My past, present, and future sins are all taken care of. Amen. As far as salvation is concerned, I'm saved. I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. I've been spiritually circumcised, Colossians 2, 10 to 13. It's an in inward thing, a circumcision that takes place when you got saved. A lot of things. And we're going to go over this in, in the future. Uh, we're going to go over this uh, in our teaching and preaching of the things that happened to you when you got saved that you're not even really aware of. You might not even be aware of it now, but you certainly weren't aware of it the moment you got saved. But a bunch of things happened. When you got saved, you were regenerated, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, you were spiritually circumcised, you were born again, you were adopted in the family of God. We ought to shout and run the aisle. Amen. 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 If you live for Christ, you'll not stand empty at the judgment seat of Christ. Paul was faithful in serving the Lord, and he expected to be rewarded by the Lord when he died. He said, I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Now think of the confidence he had to have to say this. He wasn't bragging, he wasn't being... Arrogant. He just lived for God. Yeah. You live for God, you'll be able to say what Paul said, 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 and 8. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Every person's got a course. You go out on the golf course, golf course, hole number one, two to 18 holes of golf. They got the masters going on now. Those, those are all professional golfers. They start out and they golf, you know, and they go to from one hole to the next, like that, 18 holes of golf. And they have a golf course. And they have to go to the course. And from the time you got saved till the time you die, you have a course to run. And you'll be held accountable at the judgment seat for your course. Not my course. My course is not your course. See, that's why Paul said, I fought a good fight, I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid it for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. 2 Timothy 4, verse 7 uh, and 8. My course. So we all have a course. Moses also looked forward with great expectation to his reward from the Lord. It motivated him to stand on the Lord's side, even if it meant suffering. Hebrews 11, 24 to 26. As I close, as Christians, we should be expecting the return of the Lord. The return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And uh, we ought to expect him. We ought to be ready for the Lord uh, to come back and to uh, and to live for him and to be what he wants us to be. And we are to be people of faith. And uh, I'll close with this. Peter Marshall is remembered as one of the most beloved <clears throat> Senate chaplains in American history. Marshall immigrated to the U.S., arriving at Ellis Island in 1927, only 19 years before being named Senate chaplain. He pastored in Georgia, then at Washington's New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. On January 5, 1947, he was named Senate chaplain, and his prayers immediately touched the nation. Here is his bifocals of faith prayer, it's called. Bifocals of faith prayer. Offered before the United States Senate on November 24, 1947. It is a prayer that is more relevant today than ever before in the history of our nation. Listen to this. It says, God of our fathers and our God, give us the faith to believe in the ultimate triumph of righteousness, no matter how dark and uncertain are the skies of today. We pray for the bifocals of faith that see the despair and the need of the hour, but also see further on the patience of our God working out his plan in the world he has made. So help thy servants to interpret for our time, the meaning of the motto inscribed on our coins, in God we trust. Make our faith honest by helping us this day to do one thing because thou hast said, do it, or to abstain because thou hast said, thou shalt not do it. How can we say we believe in thee, or even want to believe in thee, when we do not anything thou dost tell us? May our faith be seen in our works through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a pretty good prayer. Amen. By Peter Marshall. Amen. Though the skies be dark, we can still try to win people to God. Amen. We can still try to see people saved. We can still try to get people back in church. There's people all over Highland County, all over this whole region, all over the country, all over the world got saved in a period of time, and something knocked him out. 
devil don't care what you get involved in, just don't get real serious about serving God. Just don't get real serious about it. That's all he cares. He don't care if, you, he don't care if you're a success in it. Anything. There's nothing wrong with being a success in other areas as long as you have God number one in your life. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's stand if you would.